Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saluting Dr. Tom Frieden. Let me read the, uh, the inscription in Tom's medal. The Arnold P. Gold Foundation's 2015 Humanism in Medicine Award for the courageous invention of a new activist era in public health that improves the health and lives of the citizens of New York, the United States, and throughout the world. Tom. Thank you so much. Thanks to uh, George for such a wonderful introduction, to Jordy for such a wonderful award, to the Golds for this amazing movement, and to all of you for what you do to promote humanism in medicine. I think the leading single challenge that all of us face is the integration of public health and clinical medicine. My, the greatest influence on my life was my father. He was a wonderful cardiologist, a consummate clinician, and when I was at medical school at Columbia, the dean said, uh, you can do a preceptorship with any physician for one month. And I said, any physician? And she said, any physician? I said, I'm doing it with my father. She said, great. I spent the most instructive month of my medical school uh, following my father around and learning what it was to be uh, a wonderful clinician. And he was my secret weapon as a medical student. When I had questions I couldn't answer, things I couldn't understand, I called him up and I said, Dad, what do I do about this patient? And I remember in particular one patient I had who I, I cared deeply for. He was an older man. He had congest congestive heart failure. He was a survivor of Auschwitz. And um, he had bilateral pleural effusions from end-stage uh, heart failure. He was not a transplant candidate. And the question was, could we, could we get him some time? Could get him some time to be with his family. My father said, you know, sometimes with patients like this, what we can do is tap the pleural effusions, remove a couple of liters of fluid, and you can determine the speed with which it reaccumulates. If it reaccumulates in a couple of days or a week or two, there's not much you can do, but sometimes it'll buy them two or three months, not often, but sometimes it's worth a try. So I did that, uh, and it reaccumulated within just a couple of days. And I knew the man well enough to talk with him and say what was happening. And he said to me, what I really want is a sip of beer. <laughs> and so I went to the bodega in Washington Heights and I got a, a can of beer and I gave him a sick, sip of beer. And he had a sip of beer and he savored it. And he sat back with a beatific smile on his face. And the nurses got very upset. And the attending wrote in the physician the next morning, may have sip of beer. <laughs> Years later, when I became director of tuberculosis control in New York City, we had one fundamental concept, which was that the patient had to be the VIP of the system. We had to organize the system for the convenience, not of the doctors, not of the administrators, not of the clinic, but of the patient. The world had to revolve around the patient, not just because that's the right way to take care of patients, but because unless patients with tuberculosis complete their treatment, all of us are at risk. And that concept that the patient must be the VIP is very important because it's not about false idols and I think there are false idols in this space. It's not that the patient is always right. It's not that the doctor is always right. It's that it's always right to have a conversation. It's always right to understand and have empathy. And that's the link between the best of clinical medicine and the best of public health. In clinical medicine, we listen to the patient, we learn what the problem is, and we learn how to do the best treatment possible, whether it's cure or palliation. In public health, we listen to the community and the community of patients and clinicians, and we learn 
What's the best way we can move forward? When Ebola hit West Africa, we had an incredible challenge. We had the first Ebola epidemic the world had ever seen in communities with 70% illiteracy, with no trust of government, with no trust of modern medicine, with burial practices that are conducive to the spread of Ebola. The only way we were able to stop it was by listening to patients and providing services to patients and communities, treating patients as the VIP. When we do that, we understand that we have a common humanity. We have a common bond. And that common bond recognizes that we're all in it together. That all of our fates, at some level, depend on how people do with their own health. That all of our fates depend, on some level, on how we do as a society, caring for patients. Today, in medical care, we have lots of challenges. We have the challenge of the short term versus the long term, of listening versus communicating, of leading versus following. Whether it's drug-resistant bacteria and the need to talk to patients about getting the right treatment, not the most treatment, or pain management and the need to talk about the risks and benefits of different pain therapies so that patients can live long, addiction-free lives. It's not about the right answer. It's about the right communication, listening, the best answer for each patient in each time, and the best program for each community. Humanism in medicine is enormously important. And I would add to it one more incredibly important ism, optimism. Optimism about the future. Because even if the prognosis is not what we would wish, we have a commonality. We have an ability within the health profession to bind together patients and clinicians, communities and leaders, communities and countries and countries and the world. And by doing that, we have the ability to build a better, healthier, and more rational future. Thank you all so much for what you do.